Uh, uh, Georgia Gabriel Hooper was only 14 years old when she witnessed her mother Cheryl being fatally shot by a, her abusive stepfather. And now, in the years that followed her mother's murder, Georgia has made it her mission to stop the perpetrators of domestic abuse ruining more lives. Uh, and as she bravely shares a story on ITVX's new series, A Murder in My Family, uh, Georgia is joining us now. Georgia, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so, just to give us a... Uh, uh, the story um, from, from when you were a kid. Your mum uh, was with Andrew, or Jack, as you refer to him, uh, for nearly seven years. And this was when you were a kid, right? Yeah, they met two weeks after my seventh birthday, so um, I knew him for, you know, a large period of my life. Yeah. Did he feel like your dad, or did he feel like a stepdad, or...? Um, he certainly felt like my dad. I didn't really have uh, that much involvement with my own father, um, sort of growing up. Um, and I definitely saw him as a father figure, and I looked up to him massively. Um, and hoped that he was going to be the dad that I, I sort of never really had growing up. So what was your, your relationship like with him when you were seven? Was it a warm relationship? Was it... I mean, obviously, you didn't know any different, but, but you know, did you see the, the coercive control he had over your mother at an early age, or was it, was it cleverer than that? Um, it's, it's incredibly complex, yeah. um, and it's something that takes a long time to understand. Um, and even now, I'm still trying to understand how it works. Um, but right from the off, I, it was a very strained relationship um, and it took a lot of time for me to be able to feel um, as if I was sort of part of his family. And to be honest, I never really did um, feel that welcomed by him. Um, I always sort of felt like a, a, you know, a sort of piece of baggage that my mum mm -hmm. had um, that she brought into that relationship. Um, there was a lot of things that I recognised um, within the relationship, but I didn't necessarily have the, you know, the vocabulary to say yeah. what it was and I didn't really necessarily know exactly what was going on and what was occurring. It just kind of felt like it was just something not quite right. Um, however, I knew no better. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't my first time in that situation. Um, I knew no better, so I just had to go along with it. And Georgia, your mum was with him for seven years. Did he ever show any signs of domestic abuse in that seven years? Um, well, yes, there was plenty of times coercively, you know, a lot of coercive control. Um, he wasn't physically abusive towards my mum, um, which is something that isn't, you know, greatly discussed, really. A lot of people still think that domestic abuse is, is very much violence, um, and it is a big stereotype. Um, however, a lot of it is more coercive control. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. It was, he, was, he was incredibly coercively controlling. You know, if she went out, we'd get the silent treatment, um, you know, for going out, and it kind of became to the point where she wouldn't go out. He, would, he isolated her um, because it was a lot easier for her to stay in um, and not getting in trouble, per se, um, rather than go out and face the mood that we'd have to come back to. Um, it wasn't worth it. See, that's the... You, know, you just told us during the break. It's just It was horrific and fascinating at the same time when you said that the first time he was physically abusive to her was when he took her life, which, yeah. is, which just goes to show yeah. how important it is to see those signs of coercive control and, you know, and conflate it to coercive control is domestic abuse. Yeah, 100%. I mean, he, he was... Uh, he was threatening and intimidating, um, but actually, you know, due to his size, he was sort of 16, 18 stone, and, you know, he's a farmer, he was a big guy, and he was six foot. He could, you know, he, there wasn't a lot that he needed to do to intimidate my mum. She was yeah. only small. Um, so the violence wasn't necessarily needed, um, and he was incredibly intelligent, so he was able to tie, you know, my mum up in knots just... just just emotionally. Words and emo emotionally, yeah. Yeah. I the mean, he was coercive, but... And I'm sorry to ask you this, but how did it get to the stage where he, he shot your mum in front of you? Um, well, my mum chose to leave him. Um, so she left him on, I believe, the 9th of December um, 2017. And it was roughly, from what I've worked out, I can't remember exactly I'm, while I'm on here, but it was about 48 days um, between her leaving and him shooting her. Um, and in that period of time, he stalked us incessantly. Put a tracker on the car, is that right? Yeah, so um, we moved out. We took, basically, bags, you know, just what you'd take on holiday. Um, he still had the spare key to my mum's vehicle. Um, and late at night, he turned up at my grandparents' house and just drove the car off the drive, held the car hostage, essentially. Um, and unbeknown to us at the time, fitted a tracker to it. Um, so he was able to see where we were at all points, uh, along with driving round to her friends' houses, my grandparents' house, begging her begging them to make her come back. Um, and, you know, he was going around with shotguns and, yeah, threatening, threatening all sorts of different things. Are you aware of this? As a, like, are you seeing, a cha like, a change from what you can remember in your mum yeah. as a child? Like, are you see Yeah. 100%. There was a, there was a large change from, from 
the time that they got into a relationship, um, it was a decline over the years. My mum was a totally different person to, um, to when she met him. Um, and our relationship, you know, my mum and I were always incredibly tight. Um, but, you know, towards the end, um, we didn't really have much of a relationship, really, at all, constantly just arguing and disagreeing on things. So when he was stalking your mum, the, the police had come over before. What happened then? Yes, yeah, so the police came over to interview us um, the night before she was murdered. Um, it, we just had a single officer on his own. He came in and did a brief interview. Um, sort of, he took all the information about, you know, him threatening to kill himself and all these different things. Um, and it was kind of deemed that, that, because they'd taken his shotguns off him at this point, because he was a license holder, being a farmer. Um, so when they did this interview, they deemed that um, just, be, you know, because he was just threatening his own life, that they would just give him his shotguns back because they didn't believe he was any risk of, uh, any risk of harming us. And he, and he didn't bring the correct paperwork, is that right? Is... Uh, yes, I believe so. He did not have the DASH uh, checklist, um, which is, you know, it's a really important checklist. It helps to um, sort of identify what level of risk that you are at if you're in an abusive relationship. Um, and due to what numbers come back on that, you can be, um, you know, referred to something called Marek. So, the, yes, so the DASH risk checklist is the domestic abuse, stalking and honour-based violent assessment, which is the tool used by all police forces to identify uh, when someone might be at risk from domestic abuse. And we have got a little um, a statement from Mercier Police. Um, following Cheryl's murder, Mercier, West Mercier Police made a referral to the Independent Office of Police Conduct, formerly known as the IPCC, who carried out an in independent investigation over contact with her before she was killed. The outcome of the IOPC investigation found that while some inquiries could have been carried out more quickly or thoroughly, there was no indication that any officers or staff acted in a manner that would justify any disciplinary proceedings and that police could not have reasonably foreseen the horrific event that transpired. Uh, we would like to offer our assurances that we will take all reports of stalking and harassment seriously, and we do... Um, and do we all can safeguard those at risk? So that is a statement from the West Mercier Police there. Um, Georgia, can I ask what, what you'd like to... Off the back of this documentary and your story, what... You, would you like to see a change in law or would you like to see uh, a shift in behaviour from the police? I mean, how? what, what would you like to achieve off the back of this? Um, really just to get the word out because it's something that isn't talked about still enough. Um, there's still massively an opinion, particularly in the countryside. It's very different to being in a city. Um, that sort of, you know, what a man does at home with his wife is, is his business. Um, so there's still very backward views, essentially, um, on domestic abuse. And not enough people know what coercive control is. Um, you know, they're not aware of, of sort of the signs. And, you know, there's a, a friend of mine who I work closely with, Rachel Williams, she's a campaigner. Uh, and one of her quotes is that, you know, it's like carbon monoxide poisoning. You can't see it, smell it, uh, yeah. or taste yeah. it until yeah. it's too late, and yeah. it's true. So, I hate to ask you this question, but if, if, if people are watching this and they are suffering from domestic abuse in some way, shape or form, what, what piece of advice or what would you encourage them to do? Oh, it's a tough one because, yeah. um, you know, every situation is different um, and they all come with their own risks. Um, however, you know, you can, have a, you can have a life after domestic abuse. It doesn't always end the way that, you know, it did for my mum. Um, and unfortunately, yes, the most dangerous time for, you know, someone when they leave an abusive relationship um, is, is when they leave. You know, the most dangerous time uh, that they're most likely to get killed okay. is, is after they've left. Um, However, you know, you get to a point where the fear of staying becomes greater than the fear of leaving. Sure. Um, and, you know, you see all those risks and you just have to go. Um, but, you know, you can leave safely and you can have a, a good life. And even though, you know, I've experienced what I've experienced, I'm still out here and I'm having a good life. And, you know, I'm grateful for everything I have got. Georgia, I just want to say a massive thank you to yeah, you. To sit you, on this couch and tell your story today is very, very courageous. We have got the domestic abuse helpline on screen for people now, but you are using something that's been so horrific this happened to you and you're using your voice to make a change and make a difference and you will be helping a lot of people and a lot of women out there today so thank, thank you, you so George. much thank you. thank you it's a privilege murder thank in the you. family available on itvx tonight oh. um,